Welcome to the Soil Podcast. I'm Tom L.C. Ship. I'm Jack Gleason. <laughs> and I'm SK and I'm fed up. <laughs> Hello, and today we are talking about uh, choosing settings for your story. This is take three. The meaning behind them. <laughs> this is three and a half. <laughs> this is four, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, three and a half. Maybe someday we'll have our shit together. <laughs> I just didn't, I, I just did not expect Tom to not have enough memory. <laughs> of all the things to, to, to predict... <laughs> of all the problems we've had, mic issues, I, I just I couldn't fathom that there wouldn't be enough space on his computer to actually record. The way you said that, I thought you were like, I, did, I couldn't have yeah. imagined that Tom had Alzheimer's. <laughs> I was like, wait, what did I forget? <laughs> did I say oh, Alzheimer's? Because anyway. you said he didn't have any memory. Oh, have oh yeah. I, then I, I, I disassociated the whole, the whole rant, so I don't, I don't remember it. So today, we're going to be talking about what makes a good setting. In previous podcast episodes, we've talked about world building and making sure you pick a world that actually fits for the story that you're telling, right? You don't want to do some sort of uh, medieval fantasy, Middle Earth knockoff uh, when you're doing, say, a whodunit crime story. I mean, I guess you could, but it doesn't make sense to do that because the setting just doesn't fit for the story you're telling. Or vice versa, right? If you're telling some epic tale about ordinary people overcoming a great evil and you know you want to see the effects of that evil on the world then it wouldn't make sense for it to take place in a in a small setting like a single house or a small city or something like that because it's you need that scope uh, to be able that, to as part of the moral like that's the, the moral implications of like a great evil like sauron that infects the whole world right. as opposed to exactly, like a family drama exactly. So the idea is, you know, we've, we've talked about that sort of thing before and how the story should fit with the setting, the world that it's taking place in. But we also, we want to go a little deeper in this um, episode and talk about how that extends to the individual settings that each scene takes place in, right? Symbolically, each setting within the scene can represent certain aspects of a character's journey. And so in something like the hero's journey type story, where often the, the hero is, is a much smaller version of themselves, they have a, a much narrower view of the world, they have not they have unrealized potential, they don't have the abilities they're going to gain, etc, etc. They're a small, they're a much humbler smaller version of themselves at the beginning and it, so it makes sense for them to start in a physical location that itself is much smaller and reserve and like removed from the rest of the world and then as they g enter into the rest of the world they themselves grow and become a more powerful and more they have a larger perspective over time and so and then eventually they become the master of both worlds right that's part of the heroes they like like one of the last steps in the hero's journey and so these these settings represent the change between the hero's starting point and what they ultimately become the the hero's journey i believe also follows a kind of cyclical structure does it not where it, they start at their home it's usually a uh, small scale compared to the entire story and then they slowly or like uh, progressively go uh, through many different locations that uh, represent different challenges like I think uh, Lord of the Rings is you know an amazing kind of structure of story the way that you have Frodo starting in the Shire the Shire is a great uh, embodiment of the values of like Frodo and his people which is kind of the perspective of the story for example that's a uh, peace and serenity it's a good starting place uh, the hobbits they're very simple it's very colorful there it's it's very simple compared to like what the story is going to turn into and when uh, frodo receives his call to adventure and first goes to the forest and then to the uh the elven city and then down through the mountains of moria and he keeps getting like you know <laughs> into the like the heart of evil you know the shire starts it, it's very like bright and colorful and all this stuff and like as he goes deeper and deeper the world itself becomes darker and darker and it kind of represents um, not just in terms of the plot because he's physically getting closer to you know the where the evils sourced he himself is slowly being more and more corrupted by the ring that all kind of plays into both symbolically representing his journey but also allowing his journey to take place in the first place. Another example of humble beginnings, like a small starting place for the protagonist that kind of represents their held back potential would be Harry Potter. 
Uh, he's starting in uh, living inside of a closet inside of the Dursley's home. The Dursley's are very uh, tyrannical and representing this force, like holding back Harry. Their oppression, you know, oppression personified. It's a very common thing for the hero's journey type story to have something like that. And that's not to say that every story is a hero's journey type story, and thus you don't necessarily always start with the humble beginnings. It depends on the type of story that you're you're telling. Something to keep in mind here before we kind of go too far into this is, you know, so, you know, one of the things I, I brought up at the very beginning here was, was picking, you know, medieval fantasy over like a real world type city uh, based on the story that you're telling, right? But something you should keep in mind is that even if you're doing something that's, quote, in the real world, you shouldn't ever think about it as actually being in the real world, right? You, you're, you're not just looking at a map, picking a spot and saying, ah, that's where it takes place. All right, moving on. That's, that does nothing for you besides uh, at the, in the first page of your book or whatever saying, uh, it, it takes place here and then moving on. Um, it does nothing for you. What you need, you should be doing is thinking about the world that your story takes place in as still a fictional world. Even if it is supposed to be our world, it's still a fictional world. And there are rules that exist there that you have to be aware of and define. Because the problem is, if you don't, readers or the audience themselves, whatever, um, they are going to pick up what those rules are anyway. And if you then go and change the rules at the end, it's going to completely throw them out and it's going gonna, it's gonna to break their immersion their suspension of disbelief because it's you've suddenly broken the rules so even if you aren't aware of what those what those rules are you you should be <laughs> you should define them for yourself so you know what it is you're doing and what's possible within your story but what if you have like just an action hero like james bond does it matter where he starts do you think absolutely like if he's in paris or istanbul yes Every location needs to be representative of something. Yeah. Either the hero or the conflict the hero's in or representative of the conflict to come. Everything needs to have a reason for existing. Otherwise, why do it? If it's arbitrary to you, it's arbitrary to the audience. And it's yeah. worse. It's boring. You can't be boring. You can be anything else, but you can't be boring. Exactly. Right. There are so many other books, other shows, other movies, whatever for them to pick from and spend their time consuming. If you are going to be boring at any point, you run the risk of losing them. So being intentional, uh, as we've said many, many, many times throughout these podcasts, being intentional about the decisions you make is very important. Now say I'm just starting a story. How do I know where to start? Or should I just uh, pick a random spot? I think it depends on what kind of writer you are. If you're more like Jack, you might want to pick a location because of its inherent qualities and then figure out why you like those qualities. Or you might right. want to pick something that feels right and then explore it and see why it feels right to begin with. And then... That's that's the Tom way. <laughs> right. I, I, I would, I would subscribe with... to that as well, but okay. Maybe maybe it's your way, not mine. <laughs> I mean, I definitely go with um, what is actually happening in my story. Like, what's the transition for my characters? What kind of moral am I working with here? Um, how can I showcase the changes that are happening uh, and the conflicts that are happening with it, within this story in a physical way? And so I'll kind of, I don't really care about on the map where something takes place. I more just care about how does the place symbolically represent what's going on. So I might design, if it's going to take place in say a, a small town, you know, I might design the geography of the town to be kind of restrictive, right? There might be like mountains all over it, kind of surrounding the town to, to keep the town isolated. Or there might be some other sort of, um, you know, there might be a forest around it, or it might be on an island. You know, these are things that kind of keep the, to the town isolated, and it creates my story arena within that, right? So, and then I might create other types of spaces within that town of like elevations or whatever, either natural or man-made, that sort of represent uh, the different like statuses that people have within the town, right? So like the higher level, the higher up people who have higher status within <laughs> the, the cloud town. district. Yeah, literally the cloud district. I mean, yes. And so like yeah. I might design you know the the world based on that sort of idea of like what are the conflicts and things in place. I wouldn't do a cloud district if I'm not talking at all about the differences in like the social class between characters. If sure. that never comes up as a thing, I probably wouldn't do that. But, you know, so it's it's about like what's happening, what conflict is in is in place in play in your story and designing like the um the world in a way, or at least the arena 
in a way that actually like represents those things. And then you can do fun stuff where you have things that are that are high up at the beginning get like brought down and and you have things that are small at the beginning get expanded on or you have a character's perception of one of these places change over time and how initially it was small and cozy and now they come back to it later on and it feels like constricting. These are all things that you can play with uh, based on what's going on in the story. But once I have a lot of that stuff, that's when I might go, uh, here's a real place that kind of fits what I'm talking about. But I might not might not ever even mention that. I might not ever actually try to place it within the real world. I think people will understand based on the rules that I've developed um, assigned to it that eh, this could probably take place in any place in the world, right? If I surrounded it with trees, I could say this takes place somewhere in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> it makes sense. It's fine. You know, you don't have to have like a specific location. It just, the arena in which the conflict is taking place is really the only thing that, that, that is important. Everything outside of that, because you're not going there, it's not in the arena, it doesn't matter. That's why you don't see what's beyond the edge of the map of Middle Earth. Yeah, because it's not relevant. So to to anyone listening, you, you also can work it from a different angle. Jack Absolutely. Jack likes to have all these higher level ideas already fleshed mm-hmm. out. He likes to know what the story is about before he starts building it. Right. Now, if you're if you go the opposite direction and you have you know scenes in mind, and you, you can reference our other podcast episode. Mm-hmm. about how to how to start writing a story if you think more visually and you have all these ideas of snippets already and you you like what's happening there you can do the reverse and look at why you pick those things from your gut reaction and see if they actually tell you what the story is about instead of actually knowing the story is about to begin with because a lot of people don't start that way yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could totally you could totally do it from the opposite direction of going, well, I like this space, right? Or I, I, I like, you know, the way this this flows. And I w- like the way that these characters kind of move through it. I think just kind of stepping back for a second once you have something like that and just looking at what are the properties of this space? I think um, SK, at one point you uh, described actually forcing yourself to describe the setting, right? You you had a cafe yeah. example, I think. Yeah, yeah. In the in take two, we had a um, discussion about essentially describing a dream to yourself. When you have a dream, I think dreams are weird, high-level inspiration that you don't understand where it comes from. I think that's mm-hmm. what a lot of storytelling feels like for people like that, like yeah. me. So when those ideas come to you, they don't really make sense until you describe them out loud. And when you describe them out loud to yourself, the words you choose and the order in which you reveal things to yourself tells you what you're trying to say. And I, I think that's a that's an important exercise for anybody is that you have to vocalize things because words written aren't the same as words spoken. Mm-hmm. And you can tell a lot of things from, from which uh, medium you're using. It's like you wouldn't write think- a speech and then never practice it yeah exactly i think that's a great that's a great um point as well i think another thing you could do with that is kind of go from the see if you can enter the mind of one of your characters and then describe the same scene from their perspective and that might also allow certain things to jump out at you of like what's important to them so it might help you further develop your character or understand more about like what they're currently dealing with within the story right? What's happening internally for them. And and Um, realistically, when you're working on this process, you're going to bounce back and forth. Yeah. You're either going to know what you want to start with and then construct the scene and then look at it and realize it doesn't actually suit what you're trying to tell anymore. Or you'll start that way and deconstruct it and realize this would make a lot more sense if it wasn't in a forest. It's like uh, we have certain expectations and intuitions about settings. Like we have a I, I really like kind of subjective, overly constructive settings, like in a Snowpiercer, which is entirely set on a train, like a microcosm of all humanity just set on a train. And it's like each caboose, what do you call it? Compartment of the train. <laughs> yeah, each compartment of the train uh, represents some different aspect of humanity that the storyteller is trying to convey. And at the end, it switches the perspective, which is very interesting. I, I like that was a good idea, Jack, of like, how much would you expand like each character's perspective until you feel like you really feel a setting like fully? Like you, you shouldn't have to like write a whole story for each character, you know, but it's a difficult question for, for me to answer just because like, it's really difficult for me to just enter a character's mind and like flesh them out that way. Like I, it's really hard for me to just like come up with stuff like that. So that's why I tend to go the opposite direction most of the time where like, I already know what it's about and define my characters that way. So, right. So we have these kind of um, intuitions and expectations around settings and uh, Mm -hmm. like, 
I don't think consciously, but I'm thinking about things like uh, scale. If it's a very small setting, either it's that's like a sign of some kind of oppression or high tension, like be. a family home it or a spaceship. Be. It could be. It's it's about in, it's about your intention and your interpretation of what mm-hmm. what makes a space. So but the context, right? The context is is key to everything, and that's why picking something arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. It's just arbitrary to you. Right. People are going to be searching for the meaning for it, and if you don't have meaning behind a, a location choice, either someone is going to implant it, like like English teachers do on nineteenth century literature, or <laughs> trees are beautiful. They're not going to be able to figure out why you're doing it, and people are just going to be confused. And bored mm-hmm. the entire time. And you can't be boring. And uh, so now thinking about the different uh, aspects of setting. So like you have the scale, you have uh, light and color uh, that can convey different things mm-hmm. about like darkness or light and color. Yeah, there's different. It's many different kind of things you can go with it. There's literally trying to yeah, think about it's, this. It's things. literally just it's an it's pretty much infinite. Whatever kind of setting you've picked, there's there's an endless amount of properties that it could have that could be used. And it's really about like what are the others looking at what are the other settings in your story? What uh, yeah, back to context. What exactly. makes sense to exist within this world? And I think that's where we should pivot to talking about, you know, approaches and exercises that can help you mm. figure out what you're trying to do. Whether you want to start big, look down at everything, or you want to start from the scene and expand out, or maybe work somewhere in the middle. Right. You need a jumping off point to begin with. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't really matter what it is. It's just you have to have something to latch on to. What's your genre? Does it take place in a fictional world? Does it take place in our world fictionalized? Well, what Does, what's going like on? Actual... Who's the story about? How is it relevant to them? What why do why do the locations suit them or harm them? Because right. it should do one or the other. There should, should be a constant be conflict. Yeah, they should be either comfortable in it and some other character is not and it causes conflict or they should be uncomfortable in it and another character is comfortable in it and thus it causes conflict. And there's also the uh, return to a location. If you, for example, in the hero's journey, they return to the place of their oppression and show their new mastery of the right. skill they learned. Uh, right. Uh, whether that's Harry Potter returning to the Dursley's home or uh, Simba returning to Pride Rock. Yeah, it's it's and it's all about like that that perception from the character's perspective, right? I mean, Pride Rock is a little bit more explicit because like the rain literally washes away all the all the like skeletons and shit. <laughs> so, and yeah somehow all the soils nutrient dense next right. spring exactly exactly well all those all those bones they they instantly ah, went into the yes. soil and became bone meal you got know? it but in other types of stories where where the character comes back and it's the same place nothing's changed about it but the character has changed dramatically and so their perception of that place has changed dramatically and thus we by seeing how they exist within the exact same space, we just subconsciously understand the difference. If it's in a um, in a movie, you see this character inhabit the same space they inhabited before, and they just feel so much larger than they did the first time. You know, um, there's there's like almost no conflict because they just they've grown so much. This small space or whatever they started out in. It just it can no longer contain them, and just ha- big fish little pond. Yeah, I mean, and just and, and all it takes is that character just standing in it and looking at things, and we see it. We just understand. Now, in a book, you would see you would probably uh, uh, describe like the things that the character. You might need some adjectives, but like the things that they they look at and you know that they notice about the space are going to be different than the things they noticed about the space at the beginning, and the things they notice. Be, are different, and that shows us how they've changed as a character, even though the space has remained exactly the same. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, perspective of character, like, what they notice also shows first their values and their goals. Is that that's what guides your uh, perception. When you're thinking about your characters and making the setting, the setting is an objective, right? It's It needs the observer. What are they after? So what are they looking for? And then what are their values? What are they going to see? Like, you know, the, the hobbits are always reminiscing about the, the food of the Shire. Mm-hmm that aspect of it and comparing it to um what they're currently experiencing and by doing that we understand how they've gotten further and further away how this has become harder and harder how it's become darker and har- darker and darker how uh you know it's just it's become more and more of a struggle for them and all it do- all it takes is for them to reminisce about the same place but they reminisce about it in different ways each time too so like different parts of the shire are important at different points in the story 
Well, you can just look at the stark contrast of the beginning with the hobbits in the Shire, how Sam yeah. and how Frodo feel about being there, and then their return, and suddenly it's not just about having fun and drinking. It's about yeah. Sam's got to have a family, and Frodo can't be there forever because he can't heal from the mm -hmm. wounds he suffered mm -hmm. while fighting the Nazgul and shit. Frodo can't exist in the Shire. He can't be happy there anymore. I do think like it can be very effective in storytelling when you change the setting dramatically, like when Pride Rock becomes under Scar's control. Yeah, or... yeah that, because that location stops being Mufasa's and Simba's and starts being Scar's. And it doesn't suit anybody but Scar. Or in Star Wars, they just destroy the entire planet. That's a super radical change of the setting. It's like, well, that setting's gone forever. Well, not all what, of them. What do you all... I don't know. I can't think of a place where, um, like, the Empire actually, like, moves in. Uh, mainly because I have, I just, I'm, I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, so I haven't watched them very much. But other than blowing things up, they they have to like create bases and shit all over the galaxy as well, right? right. They, so what I'm imagining make allies and such, right? And so what I'm imagining is is you know them moving into some sort of world that is probably much more naturalistic. They move in and install all these like sleek metal machinery uh with like monochrome and red. You know, <laughs> well, all, all you really have to do is just look at. The, the Death Star and all their exactly. carrier ships and, and see yep. why it suits them. Yeah. It's militaristic. It's utilitarian. Industrial. It's, mm -hmm. it's very industrial. Everything is... It's function. It is right. just function. It does exactly what it's if supposed it to do. it doesn't function, it's dead. You notice that there are no chairs anywhere? No one sits down because they're marching. <laughs> yeah. um, what, what do y'all think about like the location as a goal? Uh, so like we when have you have... To Right, uh, some kind of Exodus story, or like the Promised Land kind of story. Not, not literally, not the religious stories, although that's an example. Well, that's that's like trying to establish society. It's the same thing. Mm. The society goes with the location. Location goes with the society. Your goal is representative of a place or a thing. Even if it's, I right. want to have the Philosopher's Stone. It's, I want to live in a world where I can have the Philosopher's Stone, which might be my living room, except I have the Philosopher's Stone in it. So I picture like the setting as goal is just like the uh, manifestation of the values that you want or like the, your the worldview that you want to see right. manifested mm -hmm. different aspects of setting uh so that was location like a setting as a goal right. like you're trying to get there uh, but not like going to mordor to destroy the ring although so, i guess that's an example let's look at some but you want to let's look at some films films are easy let's look at some films that take place in our world quote unquote and uh, look at the locations and how they're relevant to the story so frozen <laughs> What, what what do you like about Frozen settings? Like, why does she need to build her own ice castle? Like, because it's not her. It's not the castle she grew up in, which was a prison. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which, of course, she then leaves and and creates this solitary. Right. No, that it's so representative it's of the character conflict. Is, yeah. Is that absolutely? She doesn't know another way to live, so I'll create my own prison, but it's mine. It's cold. It's transparent very see-through i don't know if that's a relevant aspect i'm sure it's it not is. because it's never really brought up in the story hmm. i would argue that it so is, that, in, is the, it? in the visual styling uh, oh okay you have to make the decision on whether the ice is dirty or not mm -hmm. i would say <laughs> in a production pipeline i prefer it to be dirty that way you don't have to deal with all the refractions and the render time my point being is that when you have infinite money and you have infinite resources everything <laughs> should have a reason it's it's sort of like um it's kind of a uh, house of glass you know if you think about it mm -hmm. um it's not really secure even though she thinks it is uh which is very representative of her and her behavior that she's she's trying to isolate herself um as a way of protecting others which really is just causing more harm it's a way to protect uh, yourself instead. right it's like when you touch ice it's cold it's, it's also very yeah it's very cold it's very remote mm -hmm. Only she can survive there, and she even creates a golem to <laughs> to deal with wayward travelers. Because her moods change the entire setting, that the too. weather, the literal colors of the uh, the palace change as well. So like, um, it's really like a, a nice blue at the beginning, and like when when Anna first shows up, it's still kind of a light blue, but it becomes red when she's starting to worry more and more when she's fighting off the people who are trying to grab her it's very yellow so these are like just different ways in which the just the lighting of the same space changes based on the types of moods that she's currently in and the types of values that are in conflict um during the red um section she's alone she's just kind of sitting there wringing her hands and trying to like get herself under control and it's just more symbolic of her own um internal shit you know she's her worst own worst enemy but the uh the blue 
is much more calming and she's it's kind of freedom the ice and the the storm the wind all that that's kind of a free thing so it's kind of representative of that so she's initially thinking about it as a freedom space and then the yellow i'm trying to think of what else in the movie is yellow and where you can tie those things together but the basic point being so, that the location has right. several uses and it's it's steeped within the other details of the story and nothing about it is arbitrary like uh one of my favorite settings in a movie is um at the end of uh, the Shining. So you have the hotel, which is just confined by the snow, and because it's in the mountains. At the end, the mother and the the son uh, is a Danny. I forget the mom's name. They escape into the labyrinth, mm-hmm. and then you see the shot of uh, Jack Torrance just looking over a small model of the maze, and then it cuts to uh, like Danny running through the labyrinth. That's so wonderful. How, like that metaphor of like he has them trapped. And it's just very evocative, but it's just yeah, they uh, he's just looking at a small model of a maze. You know? I, I hate and the hotel I, itself I is hate like to, uh, to derail your point here, but your continuity is <laughs> all over the place. Oh, sorry, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, I was trying to, to, to explain too much of the movie. I'm, um, I'm just saying that he wasn't looking over the maze while they were running away from a minute. It was just they were they were walking through the maze earlier in the movie, and then uh, Danny is by himself. Running away from oh, Jack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that does happen earlier. Right. Right. I'm sorry, but so it's like a <laughs> it foreshadow. Kind of... Right. Right. Yeah. All right. No, that, that movie sure. is yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Because it shows them almost as tiny, like uh, models inside mm-hmm. of the maze, but it's just an overshot. I would say that the maze is um, it's two tiered because it's a maze itself outside the hotel, but the hotel itself is a lot like a maze with its endless right. similar hallways and seemingly no differentiation between what turn takes you where. I think it's interesting about that is how like the hotel is kind of this this prison essentially right where they're trapped and but it's still this large space and that, um, yeah, that 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 was my point earlier about how size is irrelevant until you assign it a value right just because it is a huge hotel doesn't mean that it's not a prison and the thing is that the, I think it makes more sense for it to be large and have this kind of maze like structure because it's it's about him losing his mind isn't it right so you know it it. It's that, con- it's confining it's, and suffocating, but it's it's not on the surface. It's only after a while do you realize that the entire hotel is basically one big room, and it doesn't matter what part you're in, you're still in the hotel. It's it's perfect too because like hotel rooms are these temporary spaces, so it like feels full of ghosts or memories of people or like people are here before, yeah. and it's mm-hmm. supposed to be transient. And you're there for a really extended amount of time, right. and you're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to get up and go, and it makes it feel like you're there forever because you start to be able to, you know, count the tiles on the bathroom floor and check out the wallpaper so and realize cozy. it's all the same. The veneer starts to come off. That's why hotel rooms are inherently scary places. <laughs> I love settings that are like seductive at first, like you know, Hotel California kind of thing, where it's oh yeah, like the uh, the hotel at first looks kind of appealing if you just look at us as a hotel <laughs> but it's then like, you're never um, to leave exactly I, I love when it turns like that think of like the odyssey uh where they go to is it an island of the sirens and they're like this is amazing this is awesome or no it's uh where they uh turn in the pigs that's uh i forgot her name i haven't read the odyssey i'm but, sorry you sent me a copy of it that, that's it. that's another trick you can do if you're setting the the flip flip it on its yep. head i would say if and you don't do that you're an idiot yeah it's that's it's all about that again it's that perception the the character's perception of it. it's like when they first get there it looks like it's one thing and then over time they realize it's something else their perception of it has changed because their understanding of it has changed that might be another point right, to though. make is that um, I don't think that you should use one-off locations. Yeah, no. I, I, if you're going to use a one-off location, I would say you save it for the last scene because mm-hmm. then there is no reinterpretation of it because right. usually the hero can't experience that again, especially yeah. if it's tragic. Yeah. It's like the Walter White House yeah, by the end. They... Over and over and over again, yeah. but eventually he comes back after everything has happened and it's completely destroyed, and that's, which is... That's a pretty common theme in yeah. using the, the heart the and home experience is the the house filled with love and memories and objects and then the house empty or destroyed or dismantled suddenly all the core family values aren't there anymore it's funny i've watched tons of films but like trying to pick a film mm-hmm. is actually the thing is you could pick pretty much any film and it's probably going to do something anything with its good setting. anything good well 
Well, yeah. Well, what's uh, that movie, um, American Beauty? I'm, I'm just thinking about family dramas, really, about how the family home can be such a dramatic place because it's, it's already full of, you know, the dramatic tensions that naturally arise in families. And, like, I think we talked a lot about this in Take Two. But <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, that's, a, that's like a revisit of the confining nature of spaces. Is right. that even if it's a big house with a thousand bedrooms, you're still living with the same people. And no matter what happens, if you hear their slippers down the hallway, it's like this fucking guy. He thinks he can just <laughs> walk around my fucking hallway while I'm trying to eat cereal downstairs. What and a also son the of a escape, bitch. like the secrets inside of a house are like American Beauty. The character is like laying down for bed and he pictures his teenage daughter's friend on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. naked with petal rose petals falling onto him it's like he he transforms his house into like what his perverted dreams are yeah he can't he can't escape the the confinement of the home because he would destroy his family if he did so he brings his fantasy to the bedroom so that he can he can escape while still being confined so that's his reinterpretation of this the location and you can obviously tell that the synergy of that can't continue to exist throughout the film like imagine imagine if that was told and it just it it never came to a head he just was doing his fantasy in his head and his family was fine and nothing happened with that you, they wouldn't feel like like what was the point of it you know so much of that story is tied around his fantasy and and the house that he's in um because like it's his neighbor is another extension of that right and that's a big character it's just so so the the choices made about what sort of parts of a character you're showcasing how they live within a space or just inhabit a space how that space changes over time the different things they uh, interact with within that space these are all indicative of both the plot itself the character and the symbolic messaging that you're trying to convey with your story it's all connected and you have to kind of keep all these things in mind when you are choosing what space to use. I, I like the the proximity of the neighbor too. It's like the the thing that would kill him is just next door. And that's like his tension is built all in the house. And the, the thing he should really be afraid of, which he's not he's unconscious of, is right next door. A little too close to home. Like, Bam. Yeah. There's um Exam. That's a good movie. Uh where people are locked in a room. It's like eight people who are trying to get a like undisclosed high paying job and uh, they have to take a test um in order to like within 80 minutes the whole thing takes place in that one room uh and they slowly fucking like they turn it over and their papers blank basically and there's like these rules that are designed um around the test of like you if you soil your paper it's you're you're out um if you leave this room you're out um i forget all the all, all the rules but basically the they start the timer and uh somebody like turns it over and or they all turn it over and their papers are blank right and so somebody starts writing like i think i deserve this job because and they immediately walk in and take that person out nope sorry you soiled your paper you're out and so everybody's like what so they have to like they they realize that the space itself is part of the exam and so they have to like actually explore the room which seems like a normal just fucking exam room uh, but of course, there's different things that are in there that you know they have to interact with and whatever else. Um, this sounds eerily similar to the concept of an escape room. It probably is. Or the cube. It's, this, yeah, these, all the cube sound is like, these all sound like they're on like the, the dial of Saw. Yeah. The Saw is the most extreme one. <laughs> escape room is probably one degree removed from Saw. Mm-hmm. Do people die in this one? I don't believe so, no. Then this one's somewhere in the middle. And then I guess <laughs> regular elementary school yeah. is the, the most neutered version. <laughs> Of being confined to a room to dance like a monkey for money and power. Is this a movie, or are you just talking just about your talking, elementary you know, school I'm just, experience? I'm just talking about school in general. So, I think, I think well, we went to very different <laughs> elementary schools. Did you? I'm just saying that elementary school is a confining place, and you have to pre- perform to go home, essentially. Or you can perform so badly <laughs> you get to go home, but you don't get anything out of it. That sounds exactly like the movie you just described. <laughs> oh, Education. Yeah. What about a story of no setting? Like, there is no setting. That's the is setting. That possible? The setting is no setting. Well, that, like really what, what, that, what would that look like to you, Tom? What do you it's, think that means? I guess just character consciousnesses communicating. It's like it's like, like this. Setting. It's like the character without motive. <laughs> the motive is not having a motive. Yeah. The absence of the thing is the thing itself. Yeah. Well, that sounded cool. <laughs> Bam. Quote. Put that on a T-shirt. Soil Productions. 
I don't I don't think it would be as cool if people were like, oh, that shirt, that's cool. And then they hear the quote and then it's just me <laughs> wowing myself. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the the front of it, the front of it is the quote, right? And the back of it is whoa, that sounds SK, cool. <laughs> who immediately said "whoa" to himself? <laughs> whoa, that sounds cool. <laughs> who immediately blew his own mind. I oh, I think we could sell that shirt. <laughs> the one that's the fake woke shirt. Hey, it's it's really it's really that. Just because I'm having a. A, a love reaction to it doesn't mean that it, it's not that. My interpretation of that story is different. <laughs> of what story? The story of the shirt and you saying the thing. I feel insulted. Um, okay. So, the other thing that we kind of haven't really talked about too much here is how the setting, I mean, it it, it definitely needs to be um, picked in a way that, you know, is representative of, of what's going on. Um, and it should kind of, the values of that setting should be in conflict with other settings within the story, right? And that's kind of how you symbolize what's going on there. How you determine those things, that's kind of up to you. But and we've already talked about how you might do that. But the other thing to keep in mind is that it also has to like work for what you're trying to do in the story, right? So if you have a setting that is perfectly representative of a character's internal struggle, but doesn't allow them to actually do the thing in the story in a realistic way, it's probably not actually the perfect setting. So there is a balancing act that has to take place here of can the story take place in this setting at all? And is it symbolically representative of what's going on? You know, so take like, uh, I'm trying to think of like something that would be a restrictive setting that's really good, but let's just pretend like you're, um, setting is you 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 for some reason like a car a, a person living out of their car is like the the perfect representative thing for for your character but the story is supposed to be about them being a pilot well they can't spend the whole fucking story confined to their car so sounds like you <laughs> oh, should make the car a plane very possibly right um but it, so it, obviously that so you can definitely like yeah twist certain settings even if if you found one that you feel feel like fits perfectly for your character but it doesn't let you do the thing that you're trying to get done you can probably change it still and let a different thing come in that is similar in the right ways, but different enough to let you actually still do the thing. So it, exactly the way that SK just said, right? The the cockpit of a plane is still confining and there's a lot of like dials and whatever else. And, and there's a window to kind of look out to the world, but you're really kind of limited in how many people can be in there. And maybe the person still can sleep in the fucking cockpit of the plane. I don't know how you do that. I don't know enough about how airports work. Um, well, maybe it's, uh, I think you'd probably be violating some sort of, like regulation but who knows maybe it's a crop dusting plane and it's on his farm there you go easy see there you go oh yeah so there's always there's you can always kind of tweak things around to make it work for what you need it to do but also still symbolize it symbolize things and at the same time if you found something that's like oh this is perfect for what i need it to do but it doesn't make it doesn't like do anything beyond that well it's just a waste everything I mean, needs yeah, to sure. have like three uses yeah, it's like I said, you know, there's, there shouldn't be like a one off or anything like that, right? You shouldn't have something where it's just like, I'm here for the sake of being here because it allows me to do the thing. Probably the thing that's happening could take place in many, many different locations and still work. And you should probably Especially pick the action movies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, an Exotic action movie can take place anywhere. You know? They just need things to explode around them and fast right. moving things. Right. So that's, I mean, that's why people kind of have a big, those who don't enjoy action movies, that's kind of their biggest critique is that there's like no substance to it. And that's because the things that are happening, it doesn't really matter where it is. So I'll wrap it up. Well, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you enjoyed what you heard go ahead and feel free to click that like button if you want to if you have any suggestions for future podcast ideas please leave a comment if you really enjoyed it hit that subscribe button and if you want to be notified of the next video that comes out hit the bell icon see you later fellas let's see you space cowboy <laughs> thanks for watching good job everybody <laughs> <laughs>